Such was the success of the first Speed Chess Grand Prix that Intel were keen to repeat the series in 1995. Moscow was again the starting point, with the circus moving on to New York in June, London at the end of August, and the grand finale in Paris in November. The world's elite were again tempted by large prize money and the dramatic knockout format where anything can happen, as the world champion was to find out in round one. This was the kind of action that for a few days made chess an even bigger attraction than Lenin's tomb in Red Square. Kasparov played Vladimir Apishin, a piquant encounter as Yapishin acts as second and analyst for the world champion's arch-rival Anatoly Karpov. It was rumoured that Yapishin had actually consulted Karpov by telephone before the game. Game 1 was a tense draw ending in perpetual check, but in Game 2, Yapishin found himself in trouble. Kasparov is playing black, Yapishin white. Now Kasparov's been building up the pressure for some time. He has this beautiful bishop on e5, which looks in all directions, beautiful piece. And the knight on h5 combines with the bishop to pressurize this point on g3, rather nasty. There are also the doubled rooks, which barrel down towards white's king. And now Kasparov found a really nice move to win material. He played his bishop to d4. Now, of course, if white's rook moves, let's say here, then rook takes f3, simply wins the rook. So that's the first problem. If white tries to squirm out by playing rook takes f7, then black's queen sweeps across, queen takes f7, and now when the rook moves, white's queen comes down to either f2, or f1 with a decisive attack. Capturing the bishop on d4 doesn't help either. Knight takes d4, pawn takes knight, and now for instance rook takes f7, queen takes f7. Now wherever the rook moves to the queen will just come down, for instance rook to e1, now queen f3 check, followed by knight or queen takes g3, and the game's over for white. It's a desperate situation, and it requires desperate measures. What's he going to do? All if, right. If he exchanges, the queen swings over from b7 and takes on f7, and then it's just going to post up down low, deep in the heart of white's position, Kasparov has whipped up an attack out of nothing. This, out of nothing. This could be over. This could be over. The, bish, the rook on e3 is horribly placed, and Kasparov, Kasparov has put his finger on it. And what is Ipishin going to do? That's it. Bishop d4. So if rook takes f7, queen takes f7, and then the queen just shoots down, and that's it. So Kasparov, it looks like he's won this rook on e3. Uh, incredible. I mean, just a few moves... Ago, we were talking about it being a fight, and then four or five moves later, we're talking about him winning material. Bishop takes and G6. look at this. Fantastic. A counter-sacrifice. Epician just refuses to go down without a fight, but this might just be a piece. I mean, if he takes it, what if Kasparov just takes it? So, and queen, he has, queen takes G6. And then the knight drops his G7. knight back. And he's up a minute and a half on the clock, and there's no attack at all for Epician. It looks like he has to exchange rooks now. He's going to be down a piece. So this is a desperate idea. Totally desperate idea. He's and down a minute and a half on the clock and down a piece for two pawns. And it's not like his two pawns are racing down the board and we can say, wow, look, those things are strong. That way back sitting in front of the king. Now for the first time, Epician looks nervous. He just glanced at the clock there. And he realizes... Things are looking bad. His rook is still attacked by that bishop on d4. Yeah, all Kasparov wants to do is exchange off queens right now, just get rid of some pieces, and that's going to be it. And if rook takes rook, if Kapishin were to play rook takes rook, Kasparov would play queen takes, and that would get rid of the queens. Also, if Kapishin were to move his rook, well, he's he's captured, he's captured, and queen, queen takes, takes has a current, and he's allowed queen. to exchange. Now, is he going to take the bishop? Is he going to take the bishop? And Kapishin has about two minutes left. Now it's going to get 
frantic. Kasparov around four and a half minutes. So Yapishin in big trouble. He's a piece down. Okay, now, now if he could win, if yeah, only hang he could on, win hang that on. Point. If he could, if he can play rook d3, knight of five. Now g4. Is he gonna try and? Um, ooh, well, G4, he's close. He's close to, to winning, winning that another pawn. pawn. It's a good point. And look at this dramatic move. He's brought his king up to the middle of the board, allowing all kinds of nasty discoveries. But guess what? There are none that really affect him. So now Kasparov has to give a thing. Kapishin is under two minutes, while Kasparov has four minutes plus on the clock. And Kasparov has to figure out a way to consolidate so that he doesn't start losing all his pawns. He doesn't want to lose those pawns. Three pawns for a piece could be sufficient compensation in the ending. But this, I'm sure this is okay for Black. I'm sure that Kasparov has a winning continuation here. But where is it? The world champion is studying the position, wondering what can he do to put down this ox, this this fighter. Kasparov just shaking his head there. Won't go away. Check with the knight. And now, now he's played the check. The king, can it move up to e4? Oh, look at this incredible possibility. Oh. King e4, rook to e7, check. And and you can't take. He can't king take because of knight c2 mate. Wow, mating possibilities just abound in Kasparov's game. And now he's given a check. Uh, that's, oh, that's a great check. Now the king has to has to stay on the level or move up the board. Uh, but this is still unclear. I mean, if your pigeon can just get this pawn on d4. But rook to e3. Doesn't rook to e3 go after pawns here? Okay, rook, rook e3. Then I play rook takes d4. Rook to, and the, the, white, king, the, the white, white king, king is and powerful. That, and Kasparov that, has to be careful. His knight way down in white's position might be completely out of play and man look at kasparov he's getting nervous and he's look not at the only one look at this position and yapishin's clock time is has about a minute and a half kasparov has about three minutes so <clears throat> kasparov just needs to find a decent continuation here and surely he'll be okay because yapishin he's run out of time but it's what not obvious it's not at all obvious kasparov tapping his fingers there and now Looking he's, under, nervous. he's under three minutes. His time advantage is going. He's, he has only an advantage of one minute right now. That could be significant. What is he? He's played a really, he's repeated the knight the coming back, repeated. That and Ephesian quickly moved. And Ephesian is certainly ready to accept the draw. What's his power going to do? He's up a piece. He doesn't want to draw here and he's up on time, but that's slowly ticking away. Surely Black can find some way to play on. Played. The knight to f1. What a weird square. That's an ultra bizarre possibility. But it's Gotti Pichin thinking. Ten seconds have suddenly ticked off. Maybe just for the stun effect. He doesn't want to make a mistake here. Oh. After Kasparov played such a move. That is a tricky move. G pawn moves up to g4. And now, now again it's up to Kasparov to counter. He gains some time on the clock with that last move. And Ipishin's flag is just hanging. But he's just hanging and he's nervous. He knows. But look at look at the time. Kasparov is slowly now edging towards the two-minute mark. That pawn move looked very weird. And he's brought his king up, and that doesn't even seem relevant. What's that got to do with the price of tea in China? What, what, I don't really quite get it, but he's he's certainly got Ipishin thinking again. Ipishin has to consider the possibilities. He's and he taken finally the has taken it after several seconds went off his now clock. Now rook, rook comes down. And now look at this. The rook is looking to take anything it can. And Epishin offers the exchange of rooks. And look at this. Epishin is looking to get to e6 and take the d-pawn. So Epishin has found a great move. Kasparov takes the pawn. Rook comes down. Kasparov's king had to move backwards. And look at Kasparov's knight. Still completely out of the game. Rook checks, and knight moves back into the Ooh, game. Oh, so nice the knight back in the game. And Yapishin's running out of time. He's got no time. A great check. And the flags are hanging. The flags are simply hanging. Yapishin moving his king into the game. Kasparov giving check, chasing it out. And now he's gone after another pawn. And Yapishin trying to hold on to his pawns. And Kasparov has ripped off another pawn. And Yapishin pushing his king side pawns down for all his life. But look at Kasparov holding the position. Yapishin bringing the king back, and Kasparov. Holding the position, his B-point has become very dangerous, and Yapishin is thinking about it. Yapishin, he seems to have no time at all. His flag is just hanging in the It's going to go, but he's, he's still struggling. He's still making moves. It registers 30 seconds, 
on the digital, but it may be less on the clock. It itself. looks like less. It looks like less. And Kasparov is not happy all of a sudden. And Ibishin has picked up his queen as if he anticipates queening a pawn. And Kasparov has to hurry up because his advance is going to disappear. And he plays a check. And the, the king's king is in. in. The king is in. This is dangerous. And Kasparov's knight is wandering all over the place. Now what? Ibishin has ripped a pawn and the B pawn starting to push. But the king has shifted, and what does Kasparov have? He, he really has nothing. He has an extra piece, and he's hoping to do something with it. He's his. hoping to win on time, but now Kasparov's position is looking terrible. That, he's, got, he's hoping to win on time. He's pushed his B-pawn, and Ipishin has to move instantly. He's played check, the king goes up, pawn goes down. Pawn, and now a check, and the knight has come back to save him. Look at this knight just spin, doing all these pirouettes. So Kasparov... Still holding on, but not sure what to do. And he goes after a pawn, and Ipishin rips the pawn, because Ipishin's flag has the fallen. Flag is gone. And Kasparov hasn't noticed yet. The flag is down, and Kasparov has called it. And the game is over. Kasparov has won a time. Somebody get me a heart search. <laughs> like a brilliant fight back from Yepishin, who found a series of only moves to keep himself in the game. And in fact, somewhere in this endgame, I suspect he was even better. Here, Kasparov simply has to take this pawn and force a draw after king takes pawn, king takes e6. It's a dead draw. There's not enough for either player to play for a win. If Kasparov doesn't give the piece back, then he's in big trouble. For instance, if king e7, then pawn marches to h5. And if anyone's better, it's going to be white here. But unfortunately for Yepishin, he ran out of time. That was that. With Nigel Short failing to make it through the pre-tournament qualifier, the travelling English chess fans were pinning their hopes on Jonathan Spielman. He was faced with tough opposition in the shape of the rising young Bulgarian star Vasilin Topolov. Topolov won the first game, but in the second, Spielman fought back bravely. The Bulgarian is hacking away on the king side, but the Englishman's counter-attack on the queen side is looking very strong. Spielman pushed the pawn to c6, attacking the bishop. Now, if it retreats to c8, then Spielman will play the pawn move h3 on the other side of the board. Now that means it's just held the king side for the time being. It means the bishop on c8 actually doesn't have a good square to go to. It's completely blocked in. The alternative is to retreat the bishop to e8. Again, Spielman would simply keep the position on the king side closed. And now the black bishop on e8 gets in the way a little bit of the rest of black's pieces. It might come out to f7 to put some pressure on the d5 pawn. And with hindsight, this looks to be black's best option. But instead, Topolov, who was concerned that he was going to be too passive in those positions, sacrificed the piece with bishop takes g4. Spielman naturally captured. And now we have an intriguing situation where Topolov has two pawns for the piece, and Spielman's king is wide open here on g1. There are no pawns, apart from that pawn on h2, but there are really no, there's no proper pawn cover for white's king. Very dangerous. And there's also this bishop on g7 lurking there, ready to strike. But Spielman wasn't phased. He brought the rook down to a7. Doesn't want to defend passively, it's going on the counterattack. And now Topolov made the decision to keep on going with his own attack. He didn't bother to defend the pawn on c7. He pushed the pawn to f3. Spielman captured, rook takes c7. Then came bishop to e5. That's just holding the pawn on d6, also bringing the bishop to a dangerous attacking square looking at the pawn on h2. Spielman moved the rook to e7. That's an interesting idea. He perhaps wants to play rook takes bishop. And after pawn takes rook, get two 
dangerous past pawns on the sixth rank. Very nasty indeed. The Bulgarian played the bishop into f4, attacking the queen. And Spielman moved his queen over to f2, just blocking the pawn. A very tense situation. Extremely significant to note in this position is that Black's queen is dominated. Black's queen really doesn't have any hope of ever getting in the game. It looks pretty bad, as a matter of fact. That black queen, and now, just as I said it, Topolov shifted the queen over to 8-6. But this looks like a forlorn hope to me. The point behind ah, it... Ah, maybe he wants to play queen h3 and bishop e3. Ooh, so a nasty possibility. But not only that, this is a, this is a very subtle, tricky move. Because if, if white now says, okay, my move, c7, black could think about playing rook a8, and the c7 pawn blocks the rook. He's played c7. He's played c7. And what, what if rook, if rook a8, he's played rook a8, and he's done it now, and he's threatening, oh, a vicious, this is in the game, rook a1, game over. So he has to do something about that, and maybe knight okay, d1. Knight d1. Knight d1 should defend. Knight d1 looks like it does it. Knight d1. This this still looks very good for White. I think if Spielman finds some accurate moves, he's going to be winning this position. Well, as a matter of fact, it looks like it's finished. And knight the, d1. There's no counterplay after knight d1. And knight. then rook d7, rook d8. And it's Surely it's over. That looks like a, just a total wipe. But maybe there's still one last trick, but it doesn't seem as if it really worked. Yes, well, knight, if knight d1, if knight d1, maybe queen h3, like you said, and after queen h3, he's actually threatening to play, he's played knight d1, right? And now, now if queen, the queen posts up down right in front of that h pawn, he plays queen h3, he's threatening, no, he's not quite he's threatening king bishop f8. e3, he's played king f8. That's I thought he might be threatening bishop e3, but it doesn't quite work. So king f8, well... That looks, that looks like a, an admission of he's groveling with that move. Yeah. So, where's he going to go? Rook d7. Is he going to play king to e8? Keep chasing the rook? That's a possibility. Oh, most definitely. And I think he probably would do that. He's desperate for the draw now. The, all the initiative is on is on Spielman's side. But Topolov not going down without a fight. He Boy, can, he's wrestling trying to get anything he can just to salvage his draw. So this is very, very unclear still. Spielman must be winning, but it's very tricky. Big move. Rook d7 threatening. Now, rook d8 finish. The question is, king to e8. The only move. And he's played rook h7. Oh, oh that's a great move. What a shot. That ain't going to wake him up. Oh, he can't even take on h7 because That's of knight it. f6 check. Game over. Queen takes rook. Knight f6 wins the queen. And if the queen moves, rook h8. That's the end. Rook h8 check. Oh, take the rook. Spielman has found a nice beautiful shot. Move. What a hit. And boy, that's like a George Foreman punch. That one just puts you out. You get a hit too hard and you got to go down. The knees are buckling. This, this is over. There are no moves. There's no trick. There's... He's just totally dominated. He thought the king move was going to do it for him, and it just looks over. Unless there's something miraculous, and it must be a miracle. That's he's resigned. He's resigned. Fantastic. Let's just take a look at why Topolov resigned. Spielman has just moved his rook across to h7, attacking Black's queen. Now, if queen takes rook, then knight to f6 check forks king and queen. If the queen moves across to g6, then rook to h8 check, and rook takes a8 is decisive. And if queen back to f8, then there are a number of moves that win, but the most decisive is queen to b6, playing all kinds of nasty moves like queen b8 check and queen c6 check. Very nasty indeed. With the scores level at one all, the players went into the sudden death blitz shootout. The rules were identical to last year, with one crucial exception. Instead of six versus five, 
White would start with 5 minutes and Black 4, though if the game ended as a draw, then Black would go through. Topolov won the toss and plumped for the black pieces. King's Indian again, but Spielman has changed his system. He's playing a very solid system here. Now, Topolov kicking the bishop on g5. Spielman captures, playing very solidly. Yeah, but now he's going to jump into the center with his pawns and he's trying to expand, get some space. So he's given up the two bishops, but he's gotten some space in the center of the board. Black is going to have to look to see how he can equalize against that spatial control. And he's wasting a lot of moves with his own bishops, just backing up, not doing anything special. Now Spielman needs to win. Is he going to put his, qu his king on the queen side? Maybe he's going to... Oh. After that move, I don't know. No, he's captured. I was imagining that Spielman might castle on the queen side. But after that last move, the structure somewhat favors white. So... White now has many possibilities here. This is a well-known type of formation where white can get a lot of play. Black's position remains a, a bit active, but not for too long because the white pawns dominate all the central squares, and, and there's really no place for black to put his pieces. He's castle on the king side. So this bishop on c4 of white's looking very strong indeed, and yes. Spielman playing calm move there, pawn to h3. Great move. Slows down the bishop from developing on c8. Okay, Topolov's last move, bringing out his queen on a good diagonal, controlling the really important squares, f4. So... Both sides just playing naturally here because they have to hurry up. And now a rook has posted itself on the d-line. The problem for black is that his bishop on c8, his light square bishop, really has no future. But look at this last move. Spielman has made a concrete attempt here by pushing his pawn to e5, he's thinking possibly of playing to e6. He's also giving black the opportunity to play his bishop to f5. But if black does so, you think, Danny, maybe g4 would be in order? That white would want to push that pawn right in front of his king? Spielman's favorite move, g4, maybe. But e5 is interesting. So he's trying to cut out the bishop. Maybe he wants to advance. Maybe he wants to push the pawn one square again with e6. That's a possibility. He can't. He's done it. And he's done it, sure. Go so for the Spielman goal. playing aggressively. Now... Black's king is, has been slightly weakened. Maybe Spielman can later on play knight h4. That's one possibility. But first of all, perhaps he'll play his pawn to a4 just to clamp Black a bit on the queen side. So already Spielman has managed to unbalance the position. A very interesting position. Spielman has a minute on the clock approximately, and that pawn move has split Black's army in half. Black's army is now the king and bishop on one side and the rest of the, the guys on the other side so white is going to have to look to, to go right, exit stage right, go over there and go at the king. And now he's going for it. He's playing h4 and he's looking to break that fortress down. Excellent. Spielman going on the attack. Remember, he has the white pieces. He needs to win this game to go through. So Spielman playing very aggressively. This is great stuff. Bishop comes back. That's on a nice diagonal. Aiming towards black's king. Rook comes up to e d6. Oh, that pawn is... Weak on e6. Weak is one word. Dead could be the other. Could that be. pawn looks like it's just gone. And if it goes, Black's army joins, rejoins itself. Maybe almost, almost like a lizard that got his tail cut off and now it's grown a new one. He can't just let him have that pawn for nothing. And look at this last move. Knight c4, does it, does it stop it? It doesn't look as if it prevents. Just rook takes e6. What's wrong with just taking the pawn and, and trying to connect his army? I don't know. Will Spielman give up his queen? I've seen it. I've seen him do do worse sacrifices. And he's, he's done, done it. He sacrificed. Give up his queen. Spielman playing gold chess. He loves to give up material if it means he can control the position. Typical Spielman. This but is a great game. This is very risky indeed. Topolov can surely just clamp things down on the king side with bishop to f6. Surely he can hold it. Spielman really going for it, but this is very risky indeed. And instead he's played king f7, attacking the rook. And this, this now just doubling rooks, and I think he's definitely prepared to play h5, and he's done so, and he's ripping open the position. The king side is about to be broken down, and then the white pieces might flood in. This he's is played. highly unclear. Spielman made, has made such a brave sacrifice here. He's given up his queen, and now his pieces are very aggressively placed. Remember, Spielman must win this game. Knight back to e3, threatening knight d5. Spielman really playing some...
beautiful chest hit. And now Rook D8 preventing it, and now the knight swings over. G4, Ooh, knight G4. G4. King G7, and Black is barely holding his fortress together. Just barely. One more push would put him over the edge, but does Spielman have the material to do it? Bishop E4, maybe cut... Just drop the bishop back. He's exchanged, and the fortress holds for now. But now b4, looking to remove the knight, and then his rook can post in on e7. But for the moment, he's just taken, and now knight b4. Oh, knight b4, an amazing move. Oh, a fantastic move with several threats. For one, he could play rook take c6 on the next move, and then knight e6 where the rook is, and it'd be forking everybody, a royal four, but definitely winning the queen back. It looks as if Topolov is suddenly in trouble. Spillman playing some sensational chess here. Rook d6 just barely holding the fort together. But now it seems as if he can play maybe knight c6. There's so many moves. He's looking for one. His hand is hovering. And he's played rook to e8, avoiding exchanges. But now, knight e6 a threat. But surely Topolov can... No, knight d4, rook e7, still... Well, maybe Spielman. 94 is possible, and he has to decide quickly. There's only 57 seconds left, and he's played 95. 96 check. 96, 96. Check swings back the exchange. Rook takes, and now he has to take with something. Bishop takes. He's not really threatening mate yet. Pawn takes pawn, and Topolov has a pass pawn, and he has only 52 seconds left. The bishop has retreated. Queen to d7. He's still looking to make sure he has at least a draw. The rook has swung around. This is incredible. Spielman. Has two rooks against the queen, but that pass pawn, black is a dangerous pawn. Of and now two rooks. Two rooks. He wants to chain mate. And this is mate fantastic. Is definitely threatened Topolov. Topolov under big deep. trouble. This In is fact, it. He may not even have a move. The rook g8 threat is is heavy duty, and he's played at five, giving you some air. Spillman's in. It's Spillman's not, gonna do it. it. He's played king a7, another check. He's moved his king, and now they're just blitzing. But Topolov seems to be in big trouble. Rook, Rook takes, h6, check, that's and it's it. over. Fantastic. What a fantastic. Oh, he's oh not, no. He's not no, he's still, he's not resigned. He's he's still going. On. He's playing over. He's going to lose his queen, and he's down on time. Now, surely he resigns. Surely he's it's resigned. all over. Fantastic. Oh, Spielman played a beautiful game. Wow, what a wipeout. Sensational. Out. Spielman goes through, and Topolov cannot John believe it. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from onlinechesslessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you uh, in my videos. Thank you.